Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our Ask Bay Care Clinic, our Facebook Live discussion series. We're joined today by Dr. Rory Nelson, radiologist with Bay Care Clinic, to discuss innovations in lung screenings. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Nelson. Glad to be here. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone we're taking live questions today. This is your opportunity to interact directly with Dr. Nelson. If you have questions about lung screenings, who should get them or why, we encourage you to ask them in the comments below. We'll incorporate your questions into our discussion today and answer them in real time. If we run out of questions or run out of time before answering your questions, we'll do our best to respond online after the live broadcast. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Nelson, this is this is your area of expertise. Let's talk a little bit about lung screenings and why would someone need a lung screening in, in some instances? Well, I mean, the number one uh, reason for CT lung screening is uh, for detecting lung cancer in people that are at high risk of uh, lung cancer, which uh, primarily is people with a you know, 20 to 30 year back history of smoking. Yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of those risk factors, specifically the smoking risk factor for sure. But why is it so important for that early detection and what role does a lung screening play in that? Um, well, as you know, the, the diagnosis of lung cancer doesn't have too good of statistics for the person that has it. Um, it is the number one um, killer of, of cancer in, in the, the United States. Um, and the statistics of how well you do with lung cancer depends on how, what, what size the cancer is or what stage it is. So if we can get it at an earlier stage, <clears throat> um, better chance of survival. Um, studies yeah, have shown... Absolutely. Study has shown a 20% decrease in mortality using the CT lung screening uh, program. So it's really trying to get that cancer when it's early and it hasn't spread outside of the lung into any other tissues. Yeah, give patients a better opportunity. Are there different types of lung screenings that we should be aware of? Are, you're, you're mentioning CT screening. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what that means? Yeah, so, you know, they, they've tried over the years, they, tr they tried to see if just a chest x-ray was of any value, and that never really proved to show any um, decrease in mortality for, from, from uh, lung cancer. Um, and then now with the, the CT screening, you know, we have a lower dose, uh, it's a low dose CT to minimize how much radiation the patient receives from the CAT scan. And that has shown benefit. It's, like I said before, it shows a, showed a 20% decrease in mortality from lung cancer from the people, people that uh, went through the CT uh, program. Yeah, and so you're mentioning some of these different um, kind of tools at a radiologist disposal, x-rays, CT scans, those kinds of things. Uh, can you talk a little bit of, about maybe the difference in the, in the imaging that you can receive and, and maybe how that's better or worse for each patient? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I'm, uh, most people are probably aware of uh, your, your typical chest x-ray. You know, that's a, you know, basically an x-ray machine um, sends kind of x-ray beams through you and a detector on the backside detects how much uh, x-rays make it through the person and then that creates an image. Um, a CT scan is uh, stands for computed tomography or a CAT scan uh, is kind of what it's also known for. And basically what a CAT scan does is it has a, a different type of an x-ray beam that's on a, on a rotation and that goes around the person and takes multiple numerous um, kind of mini x-rays and then using fancy computer algorithms um, creates these wonderful uh, images that basically kind of slice through the body so we can look inside in very great detail. Yeah, and then I think it goes without saying a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about the accuracy of that and, and maybe why it's sort of increased the the, the benefit for the patient? Um, yeah, so, the, you know, the, the CT scans, um, we can see stuff that's, you know, less than a millimeter in size. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable the quality and the technology that we have uh, versus, you know, a chest x-ray is kind of just a shadow of something. Um, and that, that can change depending on how things overlap within the chest mm -hmm. and, and things like that. But the CT scan, you know, lets us basically take a thin slice, you know, through through the body um, and lets us get a good detail of uh, the, the anatomy and, and the abnormalities that are in there. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to see some of those images a little bit later in our conversation. So we're looking forward to that. You had mentioned sort of the terminology about low dose. Are there any specific risk factors 
uh, involved in these types of scans that, that people need to be aware of? I mean, not really. Um, you know, people, you know, there is a lot of uh, discussion sometimes about the amount of radiation that uh, people can receive from, you know, imaging and, and that the CT scans are, are the, the number one kind of source of that. Mm -hmm. um, but even in a, a true diagnostic CT, which has kind of a full dose uh, of radiation, you know, the technology that's actually coming down over the years as well. And there's really been no proven harm to the amount of um, radiation that's received through the imaging. Um, for example, the low dose, it's, you know, it kind of depends on what you compare it against, but uh, it's at least a fifth, if not only a tenth of the, the dose of kind of a conventional CT. So it's, it's quite low compared to a, a regular CAT scan or CT study. Um, you know, so there's not really a, any real risk um, as far as that goes. Now we try to minimize the amount of radiation that people receive. Um, and that's just kind of a standard of care uh, throughout radiology and throughout medicine. Um, the other things, you know, you can get uh, kind of false positive studies, meaning that you see a, a, a nodule or maybe a mass in the lungs and you know, you're concerned that it could be a lung cancer, but it turns out to be not cancer. It turns out to be uh, infection or inflammation, mm -hmm. something like that. So that, that's kind of like the biggest you know, risk, if you want to say, is you know, finding something that you think might be cancer and then the patient um, gets that worked up, which you know, may be a biopsy or might be an additional study um, to try to figure out what that is. And if it, if it turns out to not be cancer, that's a good thing for the patient, mm -hmm. But uh, it's, you know, it's an additional step or procedure that the patient might have to go through. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're a fellowship trained in digital imaging and have a long history of, of doing this type of work. How have you seen the technology change over the years and, and what does that mean for patients? It um, means good things for the patient, for sure. Um, you know, when I first started... You know, our, our imaging for the CTs, we're looking at like five millimeter, seven and a half millimeter slice thicknesses. You know, now we get down to like 0.6 millimeter slice thicknesses. So the detail is so much better than it, than it was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but then also the, the low dose or the de decreasing the radiation um, for each to, to acquire those images has a significantly improved as well. So patients are getting a much higher detailed quality study at uh, less exposure or radiation exposure than they have in the past. You know, there's some other things that, um, that we use. There's a way we can look at the images. Um, one is we, we call them a MIP image, which is like a basically kind of a, a maximum intensity projection. You kind of compile the CT images uh, together and make the slice a little thicker. So the nodules kind of stand out or pop out a little bit easier, uh, makes it easier for the radiologist to interpret those. Mm -hmm. um, there's certainly some, you know, artificial intelligence uh, programs that are being trialed to try to help, you know, detect lung nodules. And uh, I think some of the academic centers are, are, are toying with those things more so than, um, than out in the community at this point in time, but I'm sure that'll be uh, coming down the pipeline very shortly as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well. Like I said, we're going to get into a little bit of the details and see some of the images that you see on a daily basis, I'm sure. So um, the technology is fascinating, truly. Um, if you are just joining us, we're here with Dr. Rory Nelson, radiologist with BayCare Clinic, to discuss innovations in lung screenings and talk about why uh, a person may need one and who may need one. Um, we're covering all of that today. As a reminder, we are taking questions. So if you do have questions about those things or anything about lung screenings, um, please don't hesitate. You're welcome to ask those in the comments below. Um, if you don't have questions, but you're liking the conversation, please go ahead and just give us a thumbs up to let us know that you're following along. So I wanna talk a little bit about the results of the actual screening. Um, this is something that you obviously do on a daily basis. Technicians are doing the scans themselves, but then you come in as a radiologist. Can you talk a little bit about um, once the screening is complete, um, what you actually do and what you and your, college, your colleagues do to take over and talk about the radiologist's role in sort of um, interpreting these scans? Sure. 
Yeah, so you know, we uh, get the 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 images are sent over to our imaging workstation. You know, it's a computer with some big kind of fancy monitors, and we scroll through all the images. And there's several hundred images um, in in your typical lung screening CT uh, that we look through, and basically looking for um, number one uh, pulmonary nodules, so any any sort of lung nodule, and then depending on you know, what size those lung nodules are, we try to uh, categorize those into what the, the chances of those being malignant. Um, and there's some criteria that we use through the, uh, the American uh, College of Radiology has a, a specific uh, categories that we're supposed to place uh, the nodules in. And that basically generates a, you know, whether the, the entire test is a, if it's a negative study, meaning there's no pulmonary nodules whatsoever, or there might be some pulmonary nodules that are diffusely calcified, which is notoriously benign and not related to any cancer. And those mm -hmm. sorts of things we can, you know, essentially ignore. Um, or you might get some small pulmonary nodules, you know, less than four or five millimeters that are really common and almost always are benign. Um, but those are noted so we can keep, it, keep an eye on those on subsequent years, you know, because the, the goal of a CT lung screening program is uh, to get the CT scan, you know, every year to keep an eye on things to, to catch that cancer before it grows or develops into something larger. Um, but then if we see a suspicious nodule, we need to decide, you know, is it uh, because of lung cancer or do we think maybe there could be something else going on such as infection or inflammation that could be causing that appearance. And then our, our recommendation will depend on kind of the constellation of findings, you know, other things we look for besides just the lung nodules would be, you know, if there is, uh, lymphadenopathy, which are enlarged lymph nodes, which could could be an indication that uh, there is a cancer that might have spread to some of the, the lymph nodes, or if there's other evidence of metastatic disease within the bones or in the upper abdomen, mm -hmm. uh, those sorts of things. And once we you know basically generate that report with a, a, a category, they use this it's called lung rads. It's kind of like the bi rads for mammography, if people are ever familiar with that. Um, but it basically assign, assigns this category to tell the referring physician or the patient that you know there's no significant findings. We'd like to see you next year, or mm -hmm. there's something that's probably benign, but we should get a short-term follow-up, which would be in six months, or there's something that's more concerning. And uh, we'd recommend either shorter follow-up or additional imaging or even sometimes a biopsy. And that's kind of all laid out in the report for either the patient and or the referring physician to read and the recommendations are all right there to make it you know, as clear as possible what the next step needs to be done if anything needs to be done. Yeah, and I, I think that's an interesting distinction because a lot of times people will think a radiologist just reads the, the scan and then sends out the information and then other people are making the decisions. but you and your colleagues typically do end up being sort of a part of this person's care moving forward, depending on what you find or what you don't find, right? Yes, and you know, some of the trickier cases or a lot of the cases are, are reviewed at, uh, we have a lung nodule clinic that we review with the surgeons and the pulmonologists and the radiologists that go through, um, I think we go through just about every abnormal um, CT lung screen that comes through, and then a handful of other ones that, uh, you know, incidental pulmonary nodules that uh, appear from some other imaging study. And, you know, when we'll discuss those and make sure that everyone is agreeing on the, uh, the management of that. And then, like I said, going forward, you know, if there is, is an actual unfortunate of a lung cancer, then, you know, after therapy or, and or surgery, you know, patients typically receive, you know, multiple follow-up CT scans that the radiologist is, you know, interpreting and in, in, in communication with the oncologist and the surgeons about, so. Yeah, interesting. Well, I do want to give everyone sort of a glimpse into your world because you did share with us some of the scans and some of the things that um, you can go over to kind of explain a little bit about what maybe you're seeing on a typical scan or maybe an atypical scan. Okay. Um, so we're going to bring up some images now, but specifically I want to talk about what what you're seeing or what you're specifically looking for. You mentioned nodules, those kinds of things. So can you talk a little bit about what you're looking for when you are looking at a lung scan? Sure. So um, this is a, a typical um, CT scan. This would be kind of through the upper lungs. Um, and there's you kind of see the branching the white stuff uh, in the background of blackness. That blackness is actually the lung tissue, and that branching stuff is the, is the vessels uh, within your lungs. Um, and then kind of in the middle there is a part of the, 
Um, the white stuff in the middle is part of the aortic arch, and then you have your trachea is the kind of the round circle there in the middle. Um, and then you have a couple arrows there just showing some of the small, uh, these are kind of small, tiny pulmonary nodules. These are probably about three millimeters in size, maybe two and a half millimeters. So these are fairly small um, in, the, in kind of the periphery of the lung. Um, you know, these would be categorized as, a, as benign um, and would be followed uh, on a CT screening uh, next year. So this would, this would get you a, you know, we recognize these are nodules, but they're probably gonna be benign. We'll keep an eye on them next year, but there's nothing else that needs to be done at this point in time. Excellent. So this, for, for reference, this is pretty typical of what you would see in, in quote unquote, a normal scan. Yeah, and uh, it'd be benign, you know, or, um, you know, so yeah, the, they're pretty common um, for various reasons uh, people get these. Um, and someone that said uh, has high risk factors for lung cancer, we certainly don't want to completely ignore those. They, they do need attention to on follow-up to make sure that they, they don't change or they don't grow. Yeah, and, and um, I think we have one more image of just sort of the small, and this is actually the one where you talked about that MIP um, MIP imaging. Can you want to talk about this innovation that you had talked about? Sure. Um, so on your left side, that says routine CT scan, you see, oh, it's probably a four and a half millimeter nodule, um, but without the little red circle around it there, you know, you can imagine that just looking at that in by itself, it's easy to confuse that with uh, the pulmonary vessel that's, you know, you see other places in the lung there, which are the white dots and, and kind of branching areas. Um, when we apply this, this uh, MIP or maximum intensity projection, it kind of actually takes about, a, it takes, um, you know, 10 to 20 slices of the CT scan and basically just kind of overlays them. So you get this like depth perception, almost like a 3D image um, mm -hmm. of the lungs and the, and the pulmonary vessels. And what happens when you're scrolling through it then, you see the nice linear branching pattern of the, of the lung vessels, and then all of a sudden you'll see this round circle that shouldn't be there. So it just makes it a lot easier to pick up on some of these smaller pulmonary nodules um, uh, on a lung cancer screening study. And we use this for um, regular CTs of the chest as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting. I think, I think the, the difference is pretty stark in the, in the way the layering shows up on the right. That's, that's interesting to me as well. Yeah. Um, the next image we have is actually the one that um, you had referred to where you're talking a little bit about that growth where maybe you would see something and then you would ask them to come back in for a, a six month um, follow up. So do you wanna talk about this one? Yeah, so you know the one on the left-hand side, you can see this um, around in the center of the circle. There's kind of irregular-shaped uh, nodule, and and it's non-calcified, and that's important because, like I said before, calcified lung nodules are almost always notoriously benign. They're from from previous granulomatous disease or prior infection um, in the chest, and those can be essentially ignored. Um, but so this is a non-calcified lung nodule. And you see this, if this is the first scan, you don't know if that's been there for a long time or if that's something that's new or developing. Um, so depending on the size, usually it's, you know, kind of six to I think about eight millimeters and a lung screening would get a short-term follow-up, meaning that instead of waiting a whole year, you bring them back in six months and see if there's any, any growth or, or change. Uh, sometimes these nodules, if they're inflammatory or infectious, they'll completely resolve in that short time frame, and then you don't have to worry about them anymore. Mm -hmm. But if they increase in size like this one did, that makes it you know much more concerning that this could be a lung cancer. You know, the other things we look for is um, if you can appreciate this, but there's some kind of like little speculations or little linear lines that kind of extend out from this nodule. So we call those speculations or speculated nodule, which is a, a more worrisome finding for lung cancer than if it was, you know, like just a smooth marble um, in there. Mm -hmm. Very so interesting. Yeah, but so still though, we, you know, this, um, you know, very still a small cancer and, and, you know, should be a stage one cancer and, and should be, uh, be treatable and, and do quite well compared to if this person didn't undergo screening, they would never know that this lung cancer was there until they became symptomatic from it. And at that point in time, it's going to be much larger and probably, um, you know, spread outside of the lung tissue itself, um, much poorer prognosis. 
Yeah, absolutely. Another another important reason for that early detection to catch yeah. it when it's in this stage. Yeah. I think our next image is an example of what you would measure sort of that eight millimeter um, nodule. So this is the size that you're sort of looking at maybe for those short term follow ups. Yeah, or, um, or, or below, I think like six to eight millimeters typically. Um, but uh, it kind of depends on the morphology of, of the nodule as well. And if there's, you know, if there's any change in size of the nodule, if we have any prior you know, if we have any prior studies to compare it against as well. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, if this is a, if this is a lung cancer, then that's a good size to, to pick it up at for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I do want to talk about that because cancer is obviously something that a lung screening can detect. Um, if, if you would see a nodule that would be concerning, what are the next steps for the patients in, in most instances, what would you recommend is what's the next step there? Um, so it, again, it, it kind of depends on the size of the nodule and if it's new or if we can, you know, if, if we know it's a new nodule um, or a growing nodule, then the, the, the primary um, choices are we do a, sh a short term follow up if we think it might still be infectious or inflammatory. And mm -hmm. that could be um, as low as a three month follow up if, if we strongly think it might be infectious or inflammatory, just to see if it resolves. Yeah. Um, because if it's if it is a small cancer, um, waiting the three months probably isn't going to affect the, the the outcome of the patient, um, mm -hmm. but it might prevent them from getting a biopsy or another procedure. Um, if we're concerned, then we could do a PET CT, which is a different type of uh, radiology imaging that um, we actually um, inject a, a, an agent into your bloodstream that uh, goes to cancer cells or to uh, cells in your body that are uh, call them hypermetabolic, which cancer typically is. So then that would show if there's um, activity within that lung nodule, which would be more concerning for a uh, cancer versus if we do that study and there's no activity in that lung nodule, um, that usually means that it's something benign and you'd feel more comfortable just kind of watching it. Yeah. Um, and then the other option is, is to, to, to biopsy it and to get tissue diagnosis. And that can be done using a CT scan um, and you just go through the chest wall um, with a needle using a CT scan to guide where the needle goes, or the pulmonologist can use a bronchos use bronchoscopy uh, to get nodules as well. Yeah, and I think the next image we have is actually that biopsy that you talked about where... Um... Yeah, so this is a you know, small biopsy proven lung cancer uh, within the left upper lobe. And again, you see these kind of like little speculations there. Um, but again, pretty small lung cancer and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully stage one. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, again, we're going to kind of harp on that early detection. The next image we have is also another small lung cancer, but talk again about the importance of finding them maybe when they're this size versus I think the next couple images are really where, I mean, it's late stage, um, cancer in those instances. Can you talk about that importance one more time? Yes, you know, so I, th I believe, and, um, you know, this varies from year to year, but the last uh, statistics that I remember reading about was, you know, if you, if you have lung cancer, if you take all the people with lung cancer, they talk about a five-year uh, survival rate is kind of what oncology uses to determine uh, these, this statistic, uh, meaning that um, in five, if, from your time of diagnosis, five years later, how many people um, are still alive after their diagnosis? And with, if you take all of lung cancers, um, the survival rate is usually right around kind of 15 to 20% um, if you just take all lung cancer patients. So not real great. Um, mm -hmm. But if you look at people that have stage one or early detected lung cancer, their survival rate is usually about 50%, you know, 53, 55% around that ballpark. Then if you take someone that has a lot, large lung cancer that uh, might be metastatic or stage four, their survival rate at five years is not good. It's usually less than 5%. So yeah. big difference between over 50% and 5% as far as survival rates goes. Yeah, absolutely. And the next couple of images kind of showcase what a large lung cancer does look like on, on the screenings for you. Um, this again is not great for the patient. So we can talk a little bit about what role these lung screenings play again in the patient's health, but talk a little bit about what you're looking at here. Yeah, so here you can you know see it's a 6.9 centimeter by 6.5 centimeter 
uh, mass within the, be the left upper lung. Um, you know, there's extension to the pleural or to the chest wall. I can't tell in this image if there's d evidence of metastatic disease. We don't look all the way through the, the mediastinum, which is kind of the middle part of the chest or the rest of the body. But uh, a large mass like this would have a much higher chance of having uh, metastatic disease and a, a higher, um, higher stage and, and a much poorer prognosis. Mm -hmm. I think we have one more image again showing a similar cancer. But um, yeah, before we before we talk again about um, sort of who needs a lung screening and, and your recommendations there and that kind of thing, is there anything else? I mean, we're talking about cancer, but is there anything else that can show up on a lung screen? Other conditions that 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 patients might be needing to know or those kinds of things? Oh yes, yeah. first certain, um, you know, emphysema or COPD, which people who uh, smoke a lot have a, a tendency to have or develop. Um, so you get a, you get an assessment of how, how severe or if that's present or not on the lung screening studies. Um, we can pick up incidental findings uh, such as aneurysms of like your aorta or other vessels, uh, looking at how much calcification uh, might be in your coronary arteries, which, you know, kind of has an indication of if you might have significant coronary artery disease or eventually have a heart attack. Um, other, you know, thyroid nodules, which can be incidental thyroid cancers, uh, you know, lesions in the upper abdomen, so liver lesions or, you know, masses in the pancreas, those sorts of things um, we do, you know, occasionally uh, pick up on as well. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a, a wealth of information in some of these screens. So I want to talk a little bit more too about, you know, who should be getting lung screenings? Are there recommendations um, for people who who should be getting these, or have those recommendations changed over the years? Yeah. So um, currently, so Medicare, uh, you you can you can qualify the recommendations kind of like what Medicare will approve or Medicare pays for, mm -hmm. and um, you know Medicare right now their definition for high risk would be, uh, I believe, age 55 to age 77 in that age, age uh, range, and then have a 30-pack year history of smoking. And a pack year, for those that aren't familiar, basically means like if you smoked one, one pack of cigarettes a day for one year, that'd be one pack year. So if you smoked a pack of cigarettes a day, for 20 years, that'd be 20 pack years of smoking history. Versus if you smoked a half a pack a day for you know 20 years, that'd just be a 10 pack year history. Mm -hmm. So really looking for people that's you know smoked a significant amount, um, and then that 30 pack year history is kind of the cutoff for the Medicare. And then the other caveat is that the patients are either currently still smoking or they quit smoking within the last 15 years. And the thought behind that was if you quit smoking, you know, 25, 30 years ago and uh, you haven't developed lung cancer, then, you know, maybe you'll be okay. Or at least the, the studies didn't show a benefit at that point in time. So for Medicare, it's, you know, ages 55 to 77, 30 pack your history of smoking. Uh, you're still smoking or you quit within the last 15 years. And then you're, you're asymptomatic, meaning you don't have any signs or symptoms of lung cancer. And that's important because it's really for detecting, you know, these asymptomatic lung cancers. If you have signs or symptoms of lung cancer, you should go in and, and get a, a full diagnostic CT probably to work that out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so we're talking specifically about those people who are, number one, like you mentioned, asymptomatic, but that probably have that history or are considered high risk under those categories. If yeah. I fall into that high risk category, can I just schedule my own screening or what is my course of action? Do I need to work through a, my referring provider or anything like that? Sure. And before I answer that, just um, I did want to clarify you asked before about um, have the recommendations changed at all. And, mm -hmm. you know, those recommendations were based on the, the main lung cancer screening trial results and their criteria. Mm -hmm. But we've seen such such good benefit from the using those criteria, um, the, like the United States Preventative Task Force actually has recommended changing that criteria to include um, people from the ages of 50 all the way to 80, and then dropping the, the pack years from 30 pack years down to 20 pack year history. Oh, wow. So most likely the Medicare requirements are going to be changing soon as well, um, based on those recommendations. I just wanted to clarify that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like it's going to open that pool of high risk, though, to a little bit more people. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, save some more lives. It's, it's, absolutely. So I'm sorry, what was your refresh yeah, memory about the last question? <laughs> no, that was perfect. And I'm glad that you went back to that because I think that's important information. The what I want to know is now is if I do fall into that high risk category or even potentially that new high risk category, if I'm expecting those to change, oh, yeah. what is my course of action? Can I just schedule a screening on my own or do I need to work through my referring provider or how does that work? Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage people to talk to their uh, primary care physician or if they see a pulmonologist um, initially or first and it's probably best to go through them because they could you know, probably, you know, talk to you about if you're interested in, in you know, um, smoking cessation or, or things like that as well at the yeah. time. Um, but if you don't want to go that route, you know, Aurora, Aurora Bay Care Medical Center does have a lung cancer screening program um, that you can call or I think you can go online and, and get in contact with and, and you can you can get a lung, uh, a low dose CT lung screening uh, study uh, without uh, your physician's referral necessary. So yeah. Fantastic. So if you do want to get one or you you maybe think that you might fall into one of those high-risk categories, there are options out there, even outside of maybe a primary care. And we can post a link to that um, in the discussion later. Okay. So um, you had talked a little bit about it, just and obviously it's a case-by-case -case basis, but does the lung screening then become an annual thing for these people? Is this something that we schedule similar to like our annual physical or those kinds of things? Yes. Um, as long as you are staying within that age frame you know so if you're in, in right now I'll use the you know 50 to 80 years old you would be getting it um you know the recommendation is to get it every year because you never know you know if you're still smoking or quit smoking within the last 15 years you don't know what year it's going to be or maybe that that lung cancer creeps up on you so mm -hmm. The recommendations is the goal is to make it an annual thing like you would your physical or or like women with mammography for example right right um, and you had talked about Medicare, obviously, but I, I know that this question always comes up for patients, um, just as far as insurance. Is this something, is a scan that's covered by insurance or is this something that is, again, a case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, again, I think uh, most insurance plans are all a little bit different, um, but most insurances, I, I think, should um, cover it to some degree it, as long as you have, uh, you meet those criteria. Um, I know Medicare, will, you know, covers it, you know, as long as you meet those criteria. Um, but if, you know, alternatively, I, I believe Aurora will, through the screening program, uh, you know, will will accept direct payment of, I believe it's still $99 mm -hmm. um, out of pocket um, to get one of these um, on your own if, if you don't have insurance or don't want to go, go that route. Fantastic. So, Thank you so much for this information. We have covered quite a bit today, but I think we've seen some pretty incredible technology as well. Is there anything else that you want to add? Um, I would just encourage people, you know, if you are high risk, if you, if you have that smoking history, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool. It, it, it can, could save your life someday. Um, it, it's a very quick study. I mean, once you're in the CT scanner room, it's, it's a two to five minute study. Um, you have to hold your breath for 10 to 13 seconds, maybe in the scan. That's all the scan actually takes. It only takes, you know, 10, 10 to 12 seconds. Um, and it, it could save your life, you know, and I think with that uh, lung cancer screening program, you know, even if you don't have insurance, um, you know, I think you could argue that $99 to, you know, once a year to, to potentially save your life, probably be worth it. Um, mm -hmm. Alternatively, you know, encourage, you know, the uh, best thing you could probably do is to quit smoking and not have to, to, to worry about getting a lung cancer screening study. Um, but. Absolutely. Well, we want to thank you for spending some time with us today, Dr. Nelson. We sure. really appreciate it. I think our viewers did too. Uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us. Again, Dr. Rory Nelson is a radiologist with BayCare Clinic Radiology. To be alerted about live content from Big Care Clinic, be sure to like us on Facebook and click on the bell icon below to subscribe. Uh, if you have additional questions, please ask them in the comments. We'll continue to answer them online after today's broadcast. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Big Care Clinic, visit BigCare.net. Thanks so much and have a great day. All right. Thank you.